Leslie Hertig is the artistic director uh, for the Vancouver Writers' Festival and also the offspring, one of the four daughters of famed Canadian bookseller, publisher, nationalist, Mel Hertig. Welcome to the Big Deal File. Thanks so much. We're going to talk about Mel's memoir called At Twilight in the Country, and I was most taken with how it begins. It begins with his brief encounters with three murdered Americans. Indeed, yeah. And uh, how he was affected by their lives and their deaths. Mm -hmm. Those are stories that we heard regularly growing up because they did impact him so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, my mother uh, recounted them as well. So uh, whereas my father sometimes had the, he was a great storyteller, Mm -hmm. very good storyteller. Mm -hmm. And his stories would sometimes expand as the years (laughs) went on. But because my mother also told me these stories, I know them to be true. Yeah, and and of course the three are uh, both of the Kennedy brothers and Martin Luther King. So it sort of jumps right into that. And then we go back to his early days in uh, in Edmonton, and the fact that he set up a bookstore in Edmonton in the mid fifties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it became and was the only bookstore between concentrated on books. Yeah. Between Toronto and Vancouver. That's right. You could buy books back then in the basement of Sears or uh, Woolworths or whatever the department store was at the time. But there was no dedicated bookstore yeah. at that time in Western Canada. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I admire so much about my dad is that he came to his love of books and his passion for the country and all of the things that he was passionate about on his own. He uh, hated school absolutely detested going to school. He never told me this, but I think he was a dropout. I don't know that he graduated from high school. He skipped out a great deal. Um, But what he became on his own was a voracious reader. And what he was interested in was philosophy and economics. And he read every book he could get his hands on, Mm -hmm. on those two subjects. And uh, as time went by and professors started to uh, frequent his uh, his bookstore. He used to he used to hang out with them and, and have discussions with yeah. them and, and uh, learn that way. It's true. Yeah, yeah, he did, and he formed some very uh, original ideas from these learnings that he had had in in that bookstore. He yeah. learned a great deal in that bookstore. He first set up the bookstore, and he was one of the first to ever offer coffee in a bookstore. Yeah. Way back in the 50s. That's right. <laughs> they set up chess boards and they played jazz music. They had a record player and they'd play jazz and serve coffee and, and uh, kind of embraced that whole beat culture yeah. scene that was going on south of the border at the time. Um, I think it became a real hub for intellectuals in Edmonton. They would flock to the store and spend hours upon hours there and hence the conversations that mm-hmm. came out of that. Plus, you know, he had all the the top authors stop into the into the shop because, as, yeah. as we said, it's, it was the only one in between the you know the two centers. That's quite right. One of my earliest memories is having these authors come and stay at our house. They wouldn't go stay at the hotels when they were coming through town. They'd come stay at our home. And so uh, our house would have people like Leonard Cohen and Mordecai Richler and Margaret Lawrence wow. visiting us as they passed through Edmonton. So it's no big deal for you to be hanging around with authors. <laughs> it feels just like <laughs> home. <laughs> just a couple of notes here. His, his favorite uh, autobiography was Pablo Neruda. Neruda's memoirs. Mm-hmm. Any memories? Love of... the poetry of Neruda as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. And Joe Clark spent countless hours standing and reading in the store. I didn't know that. That's right. That's news to me. Yeah, yeah. So they became sort of enemies down the road. Mm-hmm. Maybe enemies. Well, he was it's a, a red strong Tory, word. Red Tory, wasn't he? Yes, yes. But, no, it's true. 
combatants, perhaps, is the right word. Yeah, he. I mean, he came uh, became a combatant of Pierre Trudeau's as well after That's having a true. bit of a love affair with him to start with. Quite right. The Canadian market is interesting. He comments on this by the mere fact that we were uh, home to not only British books but American books as well, and he cites the figure of. 65,000 new English language titles a year and the title selection was the key for any bookseller who expects to survive. Quite right. Yeah. So, I shudder to think what that number would be today. Right. Um, but yes, I mean, I think um, a great deal of his nationalism came out of the distress over the fact that the books that he could offer in his store were produced in countries outside of, of Canada. Yeah. And that the stories of Canadians were not being told in a sufficient way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I think we... I don't know if it's a per capita number, or but but Canada imports more, more books per capita, I th- as mm-hmm. I understand it, than any other country in the world. So the dean of Canadian booksellers, he he labeled Roy Britnell as saying, "Britnell's is no longer around, is it?" No. Uh, the year I opened my first store, Roy Britnell. Then the Dean of Canadian Bookseller said, I should not be surprised if Canadian publishers cream off in the neighborhood of 50% of book sales before booksellers get a chance at what's left. No wonder there were so few bookstores in Canada. That's pretty aggressive. That is aggressive. Yeah. But uh, I, I guess he felt that publishers were selling directly and bypassing the bookstores. And I know that's one thing that Mel made mm-hmm. a point of not doing with, and we're jumping ahead, but with his Canadian encyclopedia. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, yes, I think that's true. He had certain ideas about, about what was fair and how the industry should play out. I also think that uh, when, around the time that that encyclopedia or at least the children's version of that encyclopedia came out, things changed greatly on the Canadian scene where chain stores such as Kohl's and uh, what was the counterpart to Kohl's? Uh, There was another. Classics, exactly. Began discounting titles in a way that the the industry had never seen before. But they in a really difficult position. Yeah, and when, when, when a chain store begins to do that, it changes everything forever. And that's what, of course, we saw in the Canadian industry. Um, In hindsight, was that a bad thing? I I can't say that that was a bad thing. It was good for consumers, of course. meant that consumers could get the books at a a cheaper rate. It was not a good thing for the publishers. It was not a good thing for the authors. Um, But it is how it is now. That, That there's no going back. Yeah, yeah. Knowing your inventory and about forthcoming titles is basic to good book selling. Um, and as we said before, that 65,000. In Canada, there's roughly twice the number of titles as in the U.S. Yeah. Imagine what book selling back then was like. Mm-hmm. Imagine needing to know your inventory without the use of a computer or a smartphone yeah. or a database. It blows my mind because you would need to. It, it just shows me that people back then were smarter than we all are now. Um, you would need you're they? using their brains yeah. in a different way. Yeah. You would need to know your inventory, mm-hmm. and uh, the simple act of ordering forthcoming titles would be quite a different uh, scene than it is today. <laughs> yeah. Today, you just get to swipe and click. It wasn't like that back then. And I know that uh, books are returnable, so Mm -hmm. uh, uh, booksellers, if they don't sell them, they just send it back to the publisher, but Mel found that to be a real hassle, Mm -hmm. and so what he started to do was to hold an annual one-day 50% off sale, which gave him instant cash flow, 
and made friends for the bookstore. Mm-hmm. I guess that became quite famous. It in, did. In Some of my favorite photographs from back then are of book sale day when people were lined up down Jasper Avenue early in the morning, and I believe he held it in the winter to boot. And so they were all bundled up in their fur coats and their hats. Fur and coats, which... His, his <laughs> right, exactly. Them, right, exactly. Which his father would have been selling across yeah. the street. Uh, they they would line up and yes, indeed, clear the entire store out. I asked him one time, "What happened the next day? What did you do the next day when your store was empty?" And he said, "We just started from scratch, and it was the most fun of all because." His ideas had changed by then about what he needed to have in the store. And it was like starting from scratch. And he had all this cash. He had capital to buy the books he needed mm. to start fresh and yeah. restock this, the store. This was a, a question that puzzled him. Is why so many uh, men in the book trade drank so much? And why so many law-abiding citizens steal books? Well, like priests, he was saying, and yeah, pastors, everybody, and everybody. Yeah, he used to like to start speeches out when he when he started doing his political work. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'd always tell a little joke at the beginning of every speech to warm the crowd up. And one of his favorites was to say, can, "Who out there can can tell me who steals books?" And of course, everyone was quiet, and then he'd start saying, "How about teachers and lawyers and doctors and pharmacists and." housewives and priests and yeah just basically name everybody and children the story was that they would just lose so many books out the door to shoplifters Mm -hmm. and the drinking part well heavens he certainly joined in that (laughs) (laughs) yeah the uh, in 19 uh, at least according to the book 1967 he began publishing canadian books and i think i think within the first year or two, he said that he made more profit in that one year than he had in any of the years of 16 or 17 or whatever it was prior to that with uh, with the bookstore. Hmm. So that must have made it a good happy. business. I guess yeah. it did. I didn't know that stat. And uh, in 67 or thereabouts, he became politically active and supported Pierre Trudeau mm-hmm. and I think soon developed a disgust by the way that money dominated the decision making process patronage yeah that's true he became very involved in the liberal party he became the president of the riding association mm-hmm. uh, to begin with and did a lot of work for them a lot of fundraising then he ran for the liberals in his riding in edmonton in 1972 and lost um, i think it was shortly thereafter that a uh, big disagreement happened over um, the way that funds are raised and used um, but also over oh, uh, the uh, uh, committee uh, committee for an independent Canada was struck as a result of this. It had to do with tariffs. As I understand it, he was really concerned about the fact that Trudeau did not a whole heck of a lot about foreign ownership. Yeah, of, that's exactly right. Foreign so, ownership of you know Canadian that's right. companies and, and yeah, uh, letting Canadian companies be sold off, and that of course was a, a thread that carried him all the way through until his death in, in 2016. Um, the, the, it infuriated him that Canada would sell off so much of its best companies. Yeah. And, and he would argue, and rightly so, I believe that no other country in the first world would ever sell off that kind of Canadian equity yeah. and yeah. Canadian ownership. I think the other thing that really upset him was the fact that Canadian banks facilitated this. Yeah, that's right. There's something very twisted about that. and um, Yeah. Well, it continues apace. It does, it? yeah. Yeah. So he became very disillusioned by the Liberal Party, but didn't find a home elsewhere with the NDP, yeah. although he liked much of what they were doing, certainly not with the Tories. And, and so then he tried to affect the political system by other means, by publishing books that he thought were important. Poverty 
disturbed him greatly through his entire life. Mm. Um, the treatment of our indigenous people disturbed him greatly. He, he did not understand why a country as wealthy as ours could possibly let people slip through the cracks the way that they have and they did back then. Well, and again, especially in light of the fact that uh, GDP was going way up and, yeah. and uh, profits were uh, very, very healthy, and, mm -hmm. uh, and yet over that period of time, the, the, the poor remained as poor as ever. That's right. And meanwhile, more and more American companies were buying up Canadian companies, mm -hmm. and he was seeing the influence that American culture mm -hmm. was having on Canadian culture, both within the book industry, but also um, elsewhere. Yeah. And he became a big proponent for um, Canadian cultural protectionism. Yeah, now I'm going to play devil's advocate a bit here, mm -hmm. because he frequently said, you know, if we don't curb this and change this, then we're going to be in really big trouble. So what trouble are we in right now? Well, I guess it depends on how you look at it and, and what measurements you're using. Uh, if you're talking about just foreign ownership, and if you think that we would be doing much better as a country if we had held on to much of our resources and just uh, produced them ourselves here in Canada before shipping them off, mm -hmm. if you believe that we would have done better by holding on to our headquarters and not selling them off. Uh, if you believe that, then yeah, I would say we are in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, from a Canadian cultural point of view, well, the measurements are hard to make. But if you look at the book industry, I would say that we've had some wonderful Canadian book publishers taken over by American book publishers. Uh, we have a thriving Canadian book industry. We mm. have some amazing Canadian authors, mm. and they're doing and publishers, and, publishers. Small, and they're doing very well. But the multinationals certainly are in control of of the situation, what and they mean? It means that their books have saturated the market, and that um, although small publishers are doing well, the multinationals are really the big bosses still. They're kind of dominating the, sh the shelves of bookstores. They do, yeah. I mean, look at Michelle Obama, I guess. And, uh, that's right. And you know, he's Canadian, though, but it's a multinational that's producing it. But, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's Jordan, a... Jordan Peterson. Oh, Jordan saying. Peterson. Yeah. I think that we're doing all right. But if you look at how we could have done under a different scenario, mm. we would have been doing even better. And I, so more Canadian books would be on bookshelves and people would be reading them and is that it? Well, and I think that the people of Canada maybe would understand more about themselves as well. Yeah, yeah there's a... Well, that, and okay. we, aren't, we aren't America. We aren't mm -hmm. Americans. We, don't, we haven't had a gun culture, but it's slowly seeping in as a result of being so close to them and as a result of our culture I do believe um, it's hard to say how we would be if we had better protection we've had a lot of good things in place to protect our culture as well mm -hmm. and I think those things are important and I think I, I can't remember what it's called the copy you know uh, no uh, Canadian content yeah CanCon exactly Can you know yeah. that that went a fair ways to doing for, some, for the music business. exactly for the music yeah. business yeah um, and same with what is shown on television. CBC needs to do a certain amount of Canadian content. That's slowly slipping in. Mm. I don't know. Okay. I'm not an expert there, but what I do know is that the work that he did during his lifetime and the causes that he championed over and over and over again throughout his lifetime, if you look and see, check on some of the things that he predicted would happen if we didn't act, they have happened. If you look back at his book, The Betrayal of Canada, which I think came out in about 1991, perhaps. If you look at some of those things that he predicted there, and um, some of the far-right newspapers at the time said that he was chicken little, saying the sky was falling. If you look now and see, compare what he's predicting to what today is like, he was right. He was right. Very much. We've just gotten used to it. It's just the way it is now.
It doesn't mean it's a good thing. No, again, I think Canada or Canadian business and government has always sort of taken the easy way out and made the easy money. Mm -hmm. And Canadians have a pretty good standard of living and sure there's unemployment, but you know, it's, just, it's a pretty good place to live and so maybe there's just uh, people are happy and they, you know, they're it's not It's not bad. I, I would say, and he would have said way back when, when he first published um, Harold Cardinal's book, uh, the one area here where we have got it wrong is with our the, the indigenous people of Canada and uh, mm-hmm. the fact that lands have not been turned over and Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of wrongs that still need to be righted. He said that he found politics easily the most exhilarating thing I've ever done and also the most disillusioning. And he talked about the facade of participatory democracy, which uh, which was another one of his key themes. Yeah. Is we, we, the majority of Canadians... The vast majority don't get involved at all in any kind right, of politics. Right, right. And so he would say, uh, every he went into a lot of schools. He spoke at a lot of schools, a lot of universities. The one thing that he would tell those kids over and over again is just get involved somehow. Get involved. Choose a party. I don't care if it's the Conservatives or the Reform Party. You can choose the NDP. You can choose the Liberals. You can choose the Greens. Just get involved so that you are an informed citizen and that you can make informed decisions. Yeah, and that's not happening. I mean, that's why people like uh, Trump get elected is they mobilize their base. Yeah, that's right. And then the other thing that he was really against uh, was corporate donations, union donations to political parties. Well, uh, one thing I, that struck me while reading the book, and the book is uh, At Twilight in the Country, was that he, he felt there was a radical need for reform of democracy, proportional representation. And uh, I, I think he felt that with that and foreign ownership, Trudeau let him down. And right now, you look what happened with his son, who promised electoral reform, and he let the country down. Yeah, well, governments keep doing that all over the place. In British Columbia, it's been the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think the truth is, is that a party can uh, campaign on proportional representation because it is the right thing to do. But once they get in power, they realize Mm -hmm. they'll never get in power again if we have proportional representation. Mm -hmm. Makes it pretty hard to suddenly change the rules. He got the he was very good at going and, and negotiating deals. He was very impressed with the publisher out of Vermont and, and uh, Japan, Charles Tuttle, and he went over to Japan and convinced him that uh, they should partner together and he should get the rights to their books, and that that resulted in. Some beautiful books that, uh, solid, really well-made books that Heretic Press is, is, is known for. And these are reprints of classic Canadian works of uh, history. Mm-hmm. I'm looking right now at 27 Years in Canada West, or the Experience of an Early Settler by Sam, Samuel Strickland. And these are, yeah, as I say, they're, they're lovely books. They're beautiful books, mm-hmm. yeah. And you can find them in a lot of the antiquarian stores across Canada mm-hmm. now. Yeah. Um, still looking almost brand new. Yeah, like this one. So this certainly is one of his legacies. Yeah, and, and um, I think you know already that uh, he, he loved to do public speaking. He was very good at doing public speaking, and he would go into schools and talk to kids and... He noticed very quickly when he go into these schools that the libraries were filled with periodicals produced in America, mm-hmm. with history books produced in America that got facts about Canadian history all wrong, that called the capital city of Canada Toronto, that sort of thing. And it infuriated him, and it made him want to produce more books for Canadians about Canada to mm-hmm. try to educate them about yeah. themselves and that's what led to the Canadian Encyclopedia which was his greatest achievement I would say that was swift current that's where it struck him there we go and um, that publishing job I know it was by far the largest book binding contract ever led in Canada yeah. uh, there were 150,000 
copies of, and these are three three volume sets produced. Mm -hmm. And when you consider that a, that a bestseller is five thousand, it's just yeah. mind boggling. It was mind boggling. Huge endeavor, many many employees, and hundreds of writers across Canada being pulled in to write these short, concise articles for the encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. I have people today still coming up to me. Uh, saying, oh, I, I wrote an article for your father's encyclopedia on sheep farming in PEI. <laughs> he had to go out and find each individual who was the right person to speak on any particular topic. Yeah, just talk about it. You do like an organizational nightmare. Yeah, and before computers, again, I have to say. Actually, the very first computer I ever saw was in uh, their old warehouse at Herdig Publishers. They finally... Uh, brought in a computer that would have been in 1981, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. And there's this massive behemoth uh, there chugging out papers. I don't know what exactly the job was, but they did have a computer to help with this. And I know that they worked with the University of Alberta, and they had a big computer that helped them. There we I go. Think. Yeah. But, but we should mention uh, Peter Lockheed, yes, who basically delivered four million bucks Indeed. to the project. Yeah, and what I thought was so neat was that uh, maybe this is typically Albertan. I don't know, but they said you know because Mel was looking for a couple of million bucks mm -hmm. from the province and maybe some the same from the feds, mm -hmm. and someone said no, we're, we're, we don't want them interfering with this. We'll do this it all. Exactly. Yeah, the they came million. in and saved the day. Yeah. And that money allowed for one copy of the Canadian Encyclopedia to go into every school and every library across the country, mm -hmm. which certainly helped with sales. He had trouble with the banks, though. He couldn't get a loan for this. Yeah. Similarly to... wonderful Canadian patriotic <laughs> banks. <laughs> yeah, it, that was infuriating no to was him so as well. Off, yeah, was, of course, yeah. It was the same... Answer he got when he tried to open his bookstore back in 1957. I want to open a bookstore. Why would you want to do that? They said. Well, I want to do that because there are no other bookstores in Western Canada. And it was the same answer when he went to the banks with the Canadian Encyclopedia. Why would you want to create a Canadian Encyclopedia? Because we don't have anything about ourselves yet. By ourselves. By ourselves, ourselves. exactly. Yeah. Well, and there was also, at, some, at one point, I'm not exactly sure where when this happened but one of the big banks CIBC I think it was decided to call in the loan and he played politics beautifully because it was something to do with Robarts and the U of T yeah. and the president of CIBC was going to announce this great grand enterprise to promote Canadian culture and right. Mel said how did it look to you and to that whole project that right. I say you pulled the plug and exactly. put it on the front page of it? Exactly. I forgot about that, but yeah. So he had to play hardball, he was, yeah. and, but he, he succeeded. He was a good businessman that way. He was pretty tough. I'm going to go see if Jan's here because oh, it's 6 sure. o'clock, so oh, can sure. I open yeah. your head? Yeah. Okay. Gets here, we'll, we'll get into some of the you know, maybe some specifics about her and books. As well. Sure, so, sure. Um, but in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, maybe I'll just read out. I want to read out something that he, he quoted Jack McClellan. I just want to. I just want to get this on the record. Okay. Mm -hmm. This uh, this just gives us an idea of what what publishing in Canada was like in the 50s. Alfred Knopf uh, came to Canada in 1955 and he said he came to 
see if I can uncover some Canadian writing talent, which I don't expect to do. The country seems to be peopled with involuted and convoluted Englishmen who don't have much to say. <laughs> and uh, remarkably, Knopf's words hardly stirred a fuss. In a speech the following year, the young Toronto publisher, Jack McClellan, spelled out the problems the publishing industry in Canada faced, starting with a relatively small English language population and far too few stores that sold books. As well, he said that overhead costs for sales and distribution are fantastically high, and paradoxically enough, nowhere else are so many different book titles offered for sale. As a consequence, the publisher interested in publishing Canadian books has had first to involve himself in the importation of foreign works. As more foreign works are imported, more Canadian books can be published, but because of the increased competition, relatively fewer Canadian books will be read. So that's the environment that Mel I'm not entirely off. sure things have changed. I was about to say that describes <laughs> uh, that the way things are today. Sounds familiar yeah. to me. Yeah. 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 So. Um, and you, these publishers, they need to buy foreign rights titles. Yeah. To sell in our market in order to fund publishing a book here. Yeah, and again, Mel struck this deal. But it was sort of a chance meeting with, uh, I think the guy's name was Alan Boyd, with uh, the Guinness Company. Oh, right. And so he got, the Mel got the rights to publish the Guinness Book of Records. That's right. He and brought Guinness Book of Records to Canada. Yeah. 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 I forgot about that. That paid for a quite a few of the titles that they published. Yeah. Um, but uh, he did that for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And then... They pulled the plug, and he had no idea why. And uh, that kind mm. of, I know that upset him. I'm afraid I don't know much about that piece of history. Yeah. I do know that he went on to publish uh, a glossy book on ABBA, okay. which made us all laugh, and, and uh, we didn't quite understand how it fit within the other titles he was publishing. Yeah. But it made him a great deal of money so that he could then fund other books that he was doing. Just like all the best publishers. Really. I suppose. Um, yeah, you've got to publish stuff that sells in order to do the, the stuff that doesn't, the important stuff that doesn't sell. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Nigel, this is Jan Walter. Hi, Hi Jan. How are you? Very well. Nice Good. to meet you. And you. I brought along a couple of books. Did that, you? Uh, oh, my goodness. Right. Right. You may or may not have had some involvement with. The natural history, I certainly remember, uh, but I think it's before my time. Okay. Just check the copyright page. <laughs> when, when did you start working there, Jan? Um, I should have done some background research here. Uh, <laughs> six, well, I came out, worked for your dad in the bookstores for two summers. While I was at Carleton. Why don't Why don't I uh, get you on the record here so we can because we are recording this. Oh, okay. So uh, Jan Walter has just entered the room, and Jan was the first editor. No, the second. The second. second editor in chief. There were only there was only one editor, so you could be editor in chief without having to <laughs> serve any kind of apprenticeship. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't have that much experience, but you went straight to the top. Well, I had, I had some experience in book selling. I was the editor of my university yearbook. And when I was working for Mel as a student in the summers, I happened to bring along this yearbook one year um, after it was finished at Carleton. And uh, I think that made Mel think that I knew more about book production and <laughs> book editing than I actually did. Okay. And you didn't disabuse him of that? No, certainly not. Are you no. kidding? For an opportunity <laughs> like that? Yeah. Uh, I succeeded Susan Kent, who was Mel's first editor. And she was wonderful. She was on her way to the UK. Wonderful job in British publishing. 
but I was I had about three months with her before she left. So she introduced me to the University of Chicago Style Manual, the Oxford English Dictionary, <laughs> and and tried to give me as much of a crash course in editing as I could get yeah. in that brief time. Yeah. Right. So that was what year? Do you recall? That would have been. I was just looking at this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Natural History that, of Alberta. That's the that, third book that they published in sixty. Seven. That's right. So I was after that. It would have been probably sixty-eight. Well, no, sorry, sixty-nine okay. that I, I went out and and uh, joined Mill in the publishing operation. Yeah. So what do you think about going all the way out to Edmonton? Well, because I had worked in his bookstores for two summers, uh, I was I was delighted to be going out okay. <laughs> to be going out to Edmonton. Right. Um, I clerked in the main bookstore on Jasper Avenue for two summers. And, okay. and what were your was, memories of that bookstore? Amazing. Amazing. There was no bookstore like that store in, in the rest of Canada. It was big. It was bright. It was incredibly well stocked. Uh, the major sections were arranged by publisher, if you can imagine. Uh, so all the anchor paperbacks were together. All the penguins were together. You know, all, that must have looked lovely. Well, it was an education in publishing. Yeah. You learned the imprints, you learned the publishing companies, you learned what they did. Which is what we're trying to do with this podcast, uh -huh. is to, to talk about uh, specific publishing houses mm -hmm. and all of the work that they've done right. and who was involved and that sort of thing. So Good, good. Thank well, you, you picked a good one. Here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so 69. So perhaps you could uh, just recount some of the, the, the more impressive, important, uh, beautiful books that uh, you might have been involved with uh, early well, on or throughout your career? Gosh, there were, there were so many. Mel was um, the Alberta Natural History. That's sort of one specialty that Mel had, was uh, Western history, Alberta history. Mm -hmm. um, and he published a number of wonderful books. Andy Russell, who was a very well-known naturalist. Um, he published several books by Andy. I can remember uh, J.G. McGregor and Tony Cashman, historians who did books on Alberta and Edmonton history that were very well received. I see you have one of the Canadian reprints. Those were great fun to do. They were amazing, amazing project to be involved with. Why, why were they so much fun? Well, they were fun because, first of all, Mel would find the books yeah. in, in antiquarian catalogs. He, he started to collect and That's right. get really That's interested That's right. In that. So he'd have the catalogs from the rare book dealers, and he'd pour over those catalogs, and that too was an education to, to learn about early Canadiana, mm -hmm. early, early books published about the country. And then he'd have to find uh, a copy of an original edition that was in good enough condition to be reproduced. So how back then how did they reproduce it? Did you just have a typist or did oh, they no, no. copy No, no, no. These were, these were photographed. They were done in Japan. Uh, oh, where yes, they with, could, the tu with Tuttle. Tuttle, that's yeah. right. Uh, where they had the technology. This is, how many years ago is this now? <laughs> where they could photo, photo reproduce them, very faithfully, of course. The maps, the illustrations, and then put them together in you know beautiful bindings. They really are, yeah. and they're solid. I was saying they, yeah. they look how this is. That's right. right. They were sewn. They were all cloth. sewn. Gorgeous cloth. Works of art. They were really beautifully done. Mm -hmm. And Mel was able to print these in relatively small print runs. Yeah, um, fifteen hundred. I think that's right. Mentioned. That's right. But still sell them at prices that libraries could afford, schools could afford. Uh, looking for the cover images was was fun you know i can just i remember working on one of the franklins and uh, alexander mckenzie these were quarto size these were large very large books mm -hmm. and they weighed a ton because they were on such good paper and um, so they were just beautiful beautiful things to be involved with but then we did you know there were again in the history area in the um uh the political area which I'm sure you've talked about. You may have to some extent, yeah. yeah. His sort of lifelong crusade against American domination of... Uh, Visions 2020, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> um, all, books all about the future of the country um, that people in Toronto weren't doing, um, which was, again, a, an eye-opener for this Easterner to know that you could have a national bestseller yeah. outside of Toronto. 
That book, yeah. The Unjust Society, yeah. I think was one of yeah. the jewels in, in that crown. Very yeah. important book that nobody in Toronto would touch. And Mel took that title and introduced it to Canadians, and mm -hmm. it became, I think it became a bestseller. It was, for sure. Very much yeah. a thorn in the side of the Trudeau government. Well, I guess a direct slap in the face, really, mm -hmm. to his just society. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Yeah. And The New Romans, which was another very controversial book about Canadian relationship with the United States. With a lot of well-known Canadians yes, weighing in. Yes, contributors. Yeah, kind exactly. of anthology. Or a, That's right. So to be publishing those books and getting on the cover of Maclean's or getting your books reviewed in, you know, the Toronto Star and the Vancouver Sun, it just that was that was a remarkable experience, and I could never have had that in Toronto. If I had gone to Toronto and tried to get into publishing there, I would have been, I'm not sure what, a clerk in the production department for five years before I had the chance to to see these books, you know, how books are made like that. So your role was as what? But what specifically did you do with it? Well, the, the editor-in-chief title um, covered a lot. You were involved in, you know, the manage, the sort of managing editor, just overseeing the production of the book, mm -hmm. making sure all the bits and pieces came together at the same time. Mel, Mel was doing the budgeting, but you'd keep track of budget items, of costs as they were going along. There was the actual editing, although we had a number of freelancers who did editorial work for us as well, but uh, I was allowed to do some editorial work. I wrote the ads for the books mm -hmm. for Quill and Choir or or uh, in the Edmonton Journal. Mel was very he had a uh, as a bookseller he always had a spot in the Edmonton Journal. I think it was page two, top left hand corner, perfect real estate. And he had a very very consistent style. And it was the editor's job to write those ads every week, either for a, a hurting book or for some other book that was in the store. That was the that was the other thing which maybe Leslie's explained. Mel ran the publishing company out of the back of the bookstore in his office. And the editor, Susan first and then myself, we shared an office that was a fraction the size of this room, right? It was very small. Two desks, one telephone. And that too, just to be sitting beside Mel and listening to his telephone conversations or whatever, that too is just invaluable. That was my best education, was sitting and listening to Mel's telephone conversations. <laughs> I would just sit outside his office. Yeah. He'd shut his door yeah. and he needed to get work done. Yeah. But when I would just sit as a kid and a teenager outside his office door and just listen to the conversations. Well, he, uh, he was very smooth and uh, he was uh, persuasive, right? And, he was confident uh, and confident. persuasive. Mm -hmm. Uh, any any books that you're particularly proud of having produced? It's funny when you think back. I, I only think of the mistakes I made, mm -hmm. and I remember um, there was a a Tony Cashman book. Was it an illustrated history of Edmonton or Alberta? It's not awful. I can't recall. But there was a glaring mistake in it that I did not catch. Not a grammatical or style mistake. It was a historical mistake that I should have known better. The factual mistake. The fa a factual mistake. And this was a book that I know Mel um, hoped to have adopted in the schools. So when this was discovered, and I can't remember how it came to light, uh, we thought we better do uh, have some, you know, have another reader and do the fact checking that yours truly and perhaps the author too should have done. Um, and there were several things in there, so Mel made careful note of all of these for the second printing, made sure they would be corrected. And I remember him sitting me down, I thought, this is it, I'm going to be sent back to <laughs> Toronto, Ottawa. He just said, what have you learned, Janet? And so, well, yeah, <laughs> I had learned a great deal. Mm -hmm. He just sort he, he left you on your own to do the work, mm -hmm. and then if, if there was a problem, you addressed it, you dealt with it, and, and then you moved on. Hmm. He was a very good boss mm -hmm. in that respect. How many years total did you? Did you About spend? five years. Okay, and, and, and those and were those were interesting times. It was during that time that Mel sold his bookstores, ran for parliament. Um, that was another period when he was when he was running for parliament. He had to rely on Agnes Primrose to sort of the operations manager to keep the publishing going. To and I was looking after the books, making sure the list got out. Uh, that year. Um, so again, he, he left a lot of responsibility on his employees' hands. And mm -hmm. if we screwed up, he drew it to your attention, he 
made sure you wouldn't do it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but th that was those were yeah you know, exciting times to be working with him. Uh, I'm pushing a little bit because I, I collect books. I, mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that stands out that you think is wow? This is a this is a really uh, lovely book to well, possess. I the mean, I, 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 I like a lot of the reprint series. I think are uh, those are the one I still have those on my shelf for right. sure. This is a lovely book. This was beautifully done. And this again is the oh. Natural History of Alberta. Um, Edith Fraser's books, Andy Russell's books. Duncan Pride, he was someone that, that published a book on the Ark. Now, Duncan was a great storyteller, uh, but he had been a Hudson's Bay trader, so he was writing about the North, and again, Mel was well ahead of his time mm -hmm. in, in writing about the North. Mm -hmm. He published a collection of Inuit folk tales by Father Maurice Mataye. Um, that's a beautiful book, beautifully illustrated. Um, we published one, one or two books by Peter Zosky that were huge bestsellers. And I know yeah. David Shaw. Yeah, David Shaw, right? He won an award for one of for, for, this. This Country this? in the Morning, I think. Right. Yeah, it was so imaginative. It was unlike anything that we'd seen before. His titles coming out of the North were, I think, quite unique at the yeah. time. So he did yeah. a series called Tales from the Igloo yeah. and more Tales from the Igloo, which yeah. featured in the uh, artwork as well mm -hmm. as traditional Inuit stories yeah. told by mm -hmm. indigenous people. Do you know much more about David Shaw? Um, we've ke we kept in touch for a while. I, when I did uh, move back to East, I was in publishing in Toronto, and David did some work for me there. He loved music. He was very <laughs> Martha and the Muffins were his big passion. Which? Martha, Martha and, and the Muffins. muffins yeah. okay. <laughs> and uh, do you know David? I don't, but uh, I I know him because of his work with M and S yes. and with uh, yeah. now with 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 Mel, yeah. and uh, I know that Mel was very interested in dust jackets mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. invested in in the look of, of the well as a bookseller. He knew what worked yeah. on the shelf. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Do you remember what he said worked on the shelf? Lots of white space in the ads. I remember that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I wish I could remember some of the conversations we had about jackets because they were very important. Uh, we talked about the um, Canadian Encyclopedia, which uh, really was his um, most important accomplishment. I think we could read. Mm -hmm. He got the Order of Canada, and he got all four daughters in. I know he kind of <laughs> lobbied to get you guys all in on that ceremony. That's right. <laughs> That's pretty nice. It was. That was a lot of fun, that trip. Mm -hmm. We got to go to Ottawa and to Toronto, and he took us and oh, great. showed us all the sights. and mm -hmm. Western girls out east. It was a good, good deal of fun. Do you think he was disillusioned at the end of his life, or disappointed, or fulfilled, or how would you uh, describe him? He was, to the very last day, a person who never looked back with regret on anything. Mm. And while he was disillusioned with the way that things had gone in politics, goodness knows those years of Harper's government did damage to his soul mm -hmm. and possibly his physical self as well. Mm -hmm. um, he passed away at a time when Trudeau had just come to power and while he was not a card-carrying member of the Liberal Party, I am guessing that he voted Liberal in that last election. He would never tell me. <laughs> I don't know. But he had a bit of optimism about the way that things were moving and, and I think that was because they were moving a bit more to the center again. Mm -hmm. Here anyway, not down south. Not down south. But but he didn't he wasn't alive for the Trump. He would not believe. Oh, he would not believe yeah. that. Yeah. I'm glad that he wasn't here to see that. It really is a great accomplishment, though, all the work that he did to the get work Canadian that he did, and the history and into and schools and into the yeah. you know, and living his, room. Yeah, his whole, and his whole life he had to push against people telling him no, whether it was no, you can't open a store, that's ridiculous, or no, you 
can't have a publishing company centered out of Edmonton, Alberta. That's ridiculous. Or no, your ideas about um, Canadian sovereignty are ridiculous, and here's why. He continually pushed back on that and proved himself, I believe, to be correct in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And he was never bitter about his adversaries. He just kept moving forward. And in his, in his final years, his final days even, he told me, Dear, I have no regrets. I have no regrets about the work I've done. I feel he felt very good about his life. And he knew what he had achieved. Mm -hmm. He achieved great things. Is there a bibliography of the Hertig uh, Publishing Company? Yes, in Alberta, University of Alberta Archives has a full They've got a full run plus they've got a bibliography? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Okay, so we have to go out and tell <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I hope that one day somebody will, you know, write a bit more about him because I do think he is uh, quite an individual, quite a character. A but he wrote a lot uh, himself. He, there, how many books did he publish? Mm, I think he wrote five or mm -hmm. six books. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't upset about where Canada was when he died. Well, he wasn't happy about it, but he wasn't bitter. I think that that's maybe the difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was never happy with the way things were going, and more and more, to this day, more and more Canadian companies are being sold off, and, and our resources being depleted, and the environment being raped. I mean, it's, it's a terrible situation. But he could see the positive things that were happening as well. Truth and reconciliation, that is a step forward, not a step backward. So that's positive. On the day that he passed away, Trudeau announced the um, investigation into missing and murdered women, which we now know has not gone the way that we hoped, but at the time that seemed like a step forward. So he always believed in taking steps forward. As Jan said, mm -hmm. learning, what have you learned from this? Now let's move forward. That was sort of his philosophy, I think. Mm -hmm. And he did stop. He got involved. I think that was one yeah. of his key messages and one that we should listen to, and that is mm -hmm. get involved in civic affairs and mm -hmm. Definitely. make yeah. a difference. Yeah. yeah. I think he took his citizenship responsibilities very seriously. He, it, it wasn't enough just to enjoy this wonderful country. He really felt that we owed something to the country. Lazy people frustrated yes. him. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, that's that, right. <laughs> that was certainly yeah. a message that I, as one of his children I received regularly. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything bad about him? Oh, sure. <laughs> of course. What's, what was the worst thing about him? Well, he, he had a good ego on him, absolutely. <laughs> he was funny, though. He had a really good sense of humor, I'll say that. Yeah. I'm not the right person to tell you what his faults no, were. No, no, no. What about you, Jen? <laughs> well, I guess, yeah, I guess maybe the Canadian thing is, you know, you don't, you don't uh, rise too much above the crowd, the mob. And I do remember when he would go, he was always speaking, constant speaking engagements, right? You would know this as, as a daughter, he was always traveling. And uh, going out and giving talks, giving talks. And he'd come back, he had a big map in his office of, you know, big map of Canada, and he'd put a pin wherever he had spoken. And don't think we weren't all tempted to rearrange those pins <laughs> from time to time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he'd always come back and say, just gave the best speech I ever gave. Right. Yeah. Of course, and often we were publishing the best book he'd ever published. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's right. That's there's a line there. It's like you know, the, you know, authors are asked, you know, what's your favorite book? Well, it's the book I'm currently yeah. working on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. right. He, his mm -hmm. enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. I would say second only to Jack McClellan. His enthusiasm for a new manuscript or a new book, and oh, yeah, of course, it'll be the best thing they've ever published, or the greatest account of such and such, or whatever. But you know, <laughs> he was often right. They were the best titles in their field, or they were something really unusual, you know. Mm -hmm. so, 
even Toast to the Bride, right? Yeah. One of the very early titles that he did by an um, Edmonton author named Merv Houston. Was he a dentist? Anyway, Merv, Merv was a great public speaker, and I don't know whether the book started with Mel or whether it started with Merv, but um, it was a book called Toast to the Bride. It was like toasts to make on special occasions. Yeah. And that book sold for 25 years, as long as the publishing company was in business, I think. That book just went out the door. As long as people were getting married. That, you know, or whatever, yeah. yeah. So, the, so yes, he did all of these very important books too, but he, he knew the marketplace, he knew what people needed to read in, in all kinds of areas. Well, again, that's a sign of a, a publisher who wants, knows how to survive. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, is it Abby Bennett? Abby. Abby. Mm-hmm. Bought. Bought the, the, the company. That's right. That's right. Abby owned McClellan and Stewart. He bought the encyclopedia because I, I think by that time Mel had, he was devoting himself totally to the encyclopedias. I remember going out, I was between engagements, and uh, I went out and sort of got the last of Mel's list through production because he was, he was totally dedicating himself to the encyclopedias, the junior encyclopedia that was on the horizon or had been published at that time. But yeah, that's, um, so there was the backlist, and then there were, it was the encyclopedia. I think Abby Bennett has been a bit of a rough ride for him. Well, he, but he just, passed away, you know, two years ago. Yeah. yeah. You know, although he may have turned over the McClellan and Stewart to the Germans, he's enabled m s to survive for another 10 or 15 years and he yeah. he helped out uh, Mel too it's not I mean he, he had his own personal agenda right right yeah um, well uh, keeping the encyclopedia available mm. and alive is is yes something for which uh, a debt is owed no question the disposal of McClellan and Stewart at the end of the day <laughs> was sad very sad for a lot of us who had worked in Canadian publishing below these many years. Yeah, sad and a little bit uh, unsavory. Somewhat. And, uh, yeah. For, again, for, I, I would say for people who, the Scott McIntyres of the world or the Anna Porters of the world, people who had worked in Canadian publishing and had, uh, you know, had ha- had to mortgage their houses, Mel among them, I think, um, you know, uh, to to keep their operations going, and then at the end of the day, to watch something like M and S um, become a not a tax benefit exactly, but uh, that was how it was done. Well, you know, way to get government grants, big time. Yes, although the grants, you know, couldn't save M and S. No, they weren't. Uh, they were never enough to sort of float that big a boat. Anyway, it's yeah, yeah. So, um, just then, finally, what's up with the Canadian Encyclopedia today? Well, it's Historica, right? Yeah, yeah. it's owned by Historica, and yeah. they keep it running online. It seems to have a fairly good presence mm-hmm. online. I get regular mm-hmm. um, updates via, I think I'm on Facebook or maybe Instagram with them, where I get yeah. today in Canadian history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's everything's still alive. on digital, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, as an encyclopedia would yeah. do in this day yeah. and age. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still alive. It is still alive online, and I still see sets of them in people's homes. Yeah, that's right. right. I, that, I mean, you've talked about the encyclopedia probably already, so but that is a that is an amazing <laughs> an amazing thing. Um, that oh, is oh. in so many homes, and so many kids would have been exposed to that at a young age. Um, Really remarkable thing. Well, thank you for uh, sharing your. Any other thoughts? Do you have any thoughts that you want to sh- finish with? Well, <laughs> just that uh, I'm I'm glad that you are giving Mel some attention. He deserves it. He deserves it. We we owe him a great deal. The country owes him a great deal. So get out there and start buying up some of those books in the antiquarian bookstores well, and admiring them <laughs> right. and, and getting involved in politics, that'd be mm-hmm. another way yeah, to buy Canadian, exactly Buy right. Canadian books and vote, that's right. That's right, <laughs> yeah, those are the two. Yeah.
Well, thanks for sharing your thoughts about your father, your unbiased thoughts. <laughs> uh, thanks, Nigel. <laughs> um, I miss him every day. I still go to phone. The, today, I came yeah. out of the meeting and I had this, oh, I need to call Dad. Oh, damn it, I can't yeah. call Dad. Yeah. Yeah. I miss him too. The, the industry misses him. Someone with that energy mm-hmm. and vision. Yeah. And stubbornness. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Outspokenness is true. Right. Shared his opinions. I like that. I like a person who shares their opinions. Yeah. And he's respectful. Too, yeah. 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 yeah, but he was also, he loved a good debate. So mm-hmm. he had lots of friends who were conservatives, uh, who were Tories. As long as they would engage in a good back and forth, mm-hmm. he that was a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And he admired them and respected Many many friends who mm-hmm. who he didn't agree with politically, but it was that debate and the the intellectual mm-hmm. thought that went into those conversations that he really liked. Are any of his speeches on YouTube or anything like yeah. that good? Yeah. Okay, yeah, lots because of he videos. was a mesmerizing mm-hmm. speaker. Mm-hmm. I I would like I wish that there were more from when he was younger. So a lot mm-hmm. of the older ones from you know when he was touring with Truth About Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, those earlier ones when he was touring with uh, Betrayal of Canada. Those are the ones I'd really like to yeah. hear. Barn burners. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks again uh, thanks, to Nigel. Leslie Hertig, who is the artistic director at the Vancouver Writers Festival. And Jan Walter, who is... Happily retired in Kingston. (laughs) Thanks again.